This woman nearly got clapped, so she takes justice into her own hands. We start off hearing a woman talk about the city. She says her name is Erica Bain, and she walks the city. In her words, she complains about it. Well, don't we all? She says some stuff about the city, basically about how they're losing their stories and memories. Then she rounds off her speech, and we finally see her face. This is Erica Bain, and you've been listening to Streetwalk on WNKW. She takes off her headphones and leaves the room. Then she goes into another room where she meets a woman named Carol. Carol is her boss and says Bravo called about a TV spot for Erica, but Erica says she's not a face, just a voice. She wants to stick to radio. I too have a face for radio. She leaves and we now see her calling her fiance David, who's a doctor. They're making some wedding plans. She wants him to come for Nicole's art thing tonight, but he can't sacrifice his game for that. A real man right there. Erica goes for Nicole's art thing alone, but David makes sure to come get her after. She got a little tour of the artwork, and when David shows up, she goes to meet Nicole to tell her she's going. They make a stop at home. David goes upstairs to get the dog, Curtis, and Erica's jacket, while while Erica waits downstairs. While she's waiting, he collects an apple from their neighbor, Jose. David comes back out and takes a bite off Eve's apple. Sorry, Erica's apple. Then they go off to a park where they're now playing catch with Curtis. David wants to go down the city hall and get married right away, but Erica says no. She doesn't want problems from David's mother, who wants a big wedding. Frankly, Erica herself wants a big wedding too. She says, you know, since she's not going to do this twice. Well, you don't know that, sweetheart. Marriages don't last forever. Anyway, David thinks that's the sweetest thing she has ever said to him. Suddenly, it clicks that Curtis has been gone a little too long, so they start looking for him. They see him at the end of a tunnel, but some guys have him, and they're asking for some money before they can release him. There are three of them. One of them is holding Curtis, another is filming, and they're basically just robbing David and Erica now, taking their money and jewelry. In the process, one of the guys lays hands on Erica, and David immediately swings at him. A fight starts. Not really a fight, to be honest. Two guys are just brutalizing Eric and David while the last one films. Next, we see them being rushed to the hospital. The next day, two detectives enter the hospital. They first go check on a woman who was a victim of a gunshot wound, and then they go meet her daughter in the waiting room. Detective Sean Mercer takes the little girl into a room and is asking her if her stepfather hurt her mother, and before she can even answer, the stepfather, Moreau, tries to push his way into the room, but he's stopped. Sean confronts him and then goes to take a walk to cool off, but his walk only leads him to Erica. Later, we see Erica wake up. Soon after, she finds out that she was in a coma for three weeks, and during that period, the service for David was held. He didn't make it. She's heartbroken. At least you didn't spend all that money on a big wedding. Now, she's with some detectives. She's going through some type of booklet trying to identify her assailants, but she can't. They also ask her some questions about the incident, but she can't answer. She doesn't want to remember anything from that night. Finally, she goes home. It's tough back there. She's thinking about him, about that night. She pictures him playing the guitar too, and she thinks about playing his skin flute. Then she snaps back to reality and tries to leave the house, but she hears Curtis barking in her head and goes back inside. She hasn't left the house in weeks. Now we see her take some pills. Then she's at her table smoking when a call comes in for her. She lets it go to voicemail, and it's Nicole asking to take her out. So she just puts on her jacket, takes her bag, and goes out. But she's not going to meet Nicole. It's so bright outside. In fact, everything about the outside is exaggerated in her head. The lights, the sounds, everything. She even thinks she's being followed by a man who's just going about his day as normal. Anyway, she arrives at the police station and is trying to get an update on the case of her boyfriend's death. She provides his name and hers, and the cop runs a search, picks up the phone, and tells her to go take a seat. An officer will be with her shortly, but no officer came. In fact, that was the answer the cop gave to everybody else. So after waiting for a while, Erica gets up and leaves. She goes into a gun shop. She wants to get a gun, but they tell her that she has to get a license and wait 30 days. Ain't nobody got time for that. She leaves, but a guy from the shop follows her and tells her he can get her one ASAP for $1,000. She agrees, and they go to some place and do the exchange. Next, we see Erica with a mic recording the sounds of the city. Cars moving, guys hooping, all that stuff. Later that evening, she's sitting just outside her house, smoking and listening to her recordings when Jose comes and sits beside her, and tells her not to smoke because it'll kill her. Erica says she does not care. Then Jose drops some really profound words of wisdom. There's plenty of ways to die, but you gotta figure out a way to live. Now that's hard. Indeed it is. Now we see Sean at a bar with a lady, who happens to be his ex-wife. He tells her he needs a favor from her. It's about the Moreau case. You know, the man whom he suspects killed his wife, but made it look like a self-delete. Apparently, Sean has been going after Moreau for three years, and just when Moreau's wife was about to turn state's evidence on him, she gets deleted. So convenient. Now, he's asking his ex-wife, who's a lawyer, to act on behalf of Moreau's stepdaughter. Sean is convinced the little girl knows something, and he wants to make sure Moreau doesn't get custody of her. But she says it's a conflict of interest, being that she's his ex-wife, and she also doesn't do pro bono any longer. Elsewhere, Erica goes into a store just to get drinks, and 
And before she knows it, she's eyewitness to first degree murder. Imagine her luck. But if you think she has bad luck, look at her like this. While she's still in the store after watching this man kill his wife for asking to see her kids, her phone rings. Now, this man with the murder weapon knows there's an eyewitness in the store. He's now looking for where that sound came from. But before he finds her, Erica quickly takes out her own gun, claps him, and flees the scene. But before she does, she makes sure to take the tape from the security footage. She dumps her jacket on the way home and immediately hits the shower once she gets home. She doesn't even take off her gloves. <laughs> Keeping it PG for YouTube. Thanks. Sean arrives at the crime scene and is checking out the bodies of Ida and Sandy Combs. He's also being briefed. Ida got three bullets in the torso with a 38, while Sandy got smoked with a 9mm automatic. They found three casings, but only one hit. So Sean's partner thinks the shooting was done by a crappy or far-sighted shooter. Sean, however, thinks it was done by someone who has never fired a gun before. Bingo. But the problem is they automatically assume it's a man. Sex is a moment. They also think it was a robbery, but they're wondering why the robber didn't take the money. Something isn't adding up. Should we tell them? Erica's home now examining the revolver and the tape. She gets flashbacks from the shooting and she throws the tape away. Now we see Sean at home burning a picture of him and his ex-wife. Erica's now saying something and how it is astonishing to find out there's a sleepless, restless stranger inside you. The next morning, she's speaking into the mic about New York while taking a smoke. Then she goes, takes her pills, and empties them in the toilet. She's practicing to get back on her show. Now she's at the office trying to get her show back, but Carol thinks she isn't ready yet. Considering all she has been through in recent times, Erica tells her she just needs to keep living. She doesn't want to disappear. She needs her job. Carol folds and lets Erica go live. Street walk is back, but just one sentence in and Erica freezes. She indeed is not ready. But Erica has been doing this for too long, so she gets her mojo back. She abandons what she initially had written and just starts freestyling about living with fear in the city of New York. She talks about how she always believed fear belonged to weaker people until it touched her. After she's done with her monologue, she goes to the place where David was buried and just stays there all day. She leaves at night and is doing her normal recording while she's on the subway. Then some two guys start bullying a younger boy. They also harass an older man who was trying to help the boy. The man was with his son. All three dudes get off the subway. Now it's just these two bullies and Erica left. They approach her with a knife and while one of them is running a knife through her face and neck, she just brings out her pistol, claps both of them, and leaves. But again, the casings. When she's off the subway, she starts wishing she didn't clap them. She's thinking she actually could have just shown the guys the gun and they wouldn't have hurt her. She's asking herself why her hands are not shaking as she's walking home. Alpha female moment. Now, Sean and his partner get a call about the homicide and they head out to the crime scene. Erica goes into a bar and just heads straight for the toilet and pukes. Freshens up, takes off her hoodie, comes out, and heads back to the subway. Sean and the cops are examining the crime scene and boom, they find that the shooting was from a 9mm. You know, like from the other night. They connect this case with the murder of the Combs and their theory is that this was done by an average Joe that no one would even notice. But he's getting better because this time, every shot hit home. Someone turned on Aimbot. And of course, they still think it's a guy. Can women ever catch a break? Leaving the crime scene, Sean is being harassed by the press, but he catches sight of Erica and goes up to her. She introduces herself as Erica Bain from radio and says she wants to do an interview on him, but he says they're not talking to the press right now. She tries to convince him, but he just gets in his car and leaves. Erica gets back home and listens to her own recording of the shooting on the subway while she's on her bed. The next day, Sean is telling his partner about Erica and how this lady from radio wants to interview him. He then asks that everybody who was on the subway that night be brought in. Erica gets to her office and Carol is there waiting for her. They finally have the overdue conversation about that last show in the long silence, but she says people are responding, so she encourages is Erica to keep it up. Next thing, Erica is walking out of her office building and she sees Sean outside waiting for her. She thinks he has found her out, so she immediately turns back. You can see guilt written all over her face. He notices that she has turned, so he chases her, catches up with her, and introduces himself. He explains to her that he stopped her at the subway last night because he remembered seeing her at the hospital. You know, from that time her and her boyfriend got clapped. He tells her he checked into her case and they will find the men who killed her boyfriend. He then agrees to do an interview with her. So they go to a coffee shop and she's asking questions. They I feel like they're for more than just the interview. She asks what he first looks for when he gets to a crime scene. Then she segues into the homicide of the subway. Then Moreau appears on the screen. And Sean now asks Erica if she has ever read about him. She hasn't. So she asks Sean about him, and he says he'll only answer if it's off the record. She shuts off her recorder, and he goes on to tell her that Moreau imports drugs, guns, people, and all types of illegal stuff, and he brutalizes anyone who dares to cross him. Sean tells her about how he once found some guys with their hands super glued to a table and expanding cement in their throats. He also tells her how he had Moreau's wife ready to testify, and then she turns up dead, and he gains custody of the woman's daughter. Now back on record, Erica asks why he hasn't been able to nail Moreau, and Sean's reply was, because I follow the law. She then then asks if there's nothing he can do. 
do. And he says nothing that's legal, but he immediately regrets saying that. But Erica is gang, you know? So she deletes that statement from her recorder right in front of him, and they get on with the interview. She asks Sean if he has ever shot anyone, and his answer was unsurprisingly yes. I mean, he's a cop. They're pretty trigger happy these days. But stay with me, we're getting somewhere. Erica now asks if his hand shook when he shot the person, and he says no. But that's one of the benefits of being on the right side, he says. Wait for it. A benefit that that asshole and the subway shooter don't have. Boom. Erica asks Sean if he thinks they're the same, and he says, both walked away from a murder, didn't they? Then Sean asks her how she managed to pull it all back together, after everything that happened. You know, losing her boyfriend and all that. But he immediately apologizes for asking because he thinks it was an invasive question. But she's like, it's cool. Fair question. So she goes on to answer. She says, you become someone else. A stranger. He replies, you must have loved him very much. Sometimes that just makes it harder. You know, you just wish you didn't. And that wraps up the interview. He hands Erica his card and tells her she can call him anytime she wants to talk about her case. I warn you, I don't sleep, she says. And he replies, neither do I. Relatable. I'll just remind you at this point that these are two relatively freshly single adults. I'll leave it at that for now. If you know, you know. Later at night, she's taking a walk. And we hear her saying she walks the streets at night now. And she's finding things she never knew existed. But she's wondering if she's finding them or if they're finding her. During her walk, she sees a pimp who calls out to her. She gets in the backseat of his car where a lady named Chloe is lying, obviously drugged up. She's been with this dude for about four to six days now, but Erica is determined to save her. So she pulls her gun on the man and tells him to open the door and pay Chloe. He does, and they both get out of the car. As they're walking, the man tries to run them over, but Erica shoots him and he runs off the road, hitting Chloe in the process and breaking her leg. Oopsie. An ambulance comes for Chloe, but Erica makes sure she's not seen. We now hear her voice saying there's no going back. This stranger is who she is now. She gets home and Jose is sitting outside. She she asks Erica if she's okay, because you notice her hands are cold and her lipstick is smudged. Erica just said that this is the first time Jose ever said her name and she went inside. Next day at a press conference, Sean is saying that the shootings from last night, the supermarket, and the subway were all done with the same gun. But the only difference is that there's a witness from last night, but they haven't yet interviewed her. While he's talking to the press, Erica comes in and you can tell her entrance distracted him. After the conference, they meet outside and talk. She aired some parts of their interview in her show earlier in the day and he heard it. He's saying every other reporter in that room might sensationalize this whole case, but he knows she won't. And how does he know that? From her show. These two are now sharing laughs and paying each other compliments. Hmm, love is in the air. She asks about Chloe, and Sanchez she's pretty banged up, but they'll know more tomorrow. They shake hands and Erica leaves for her office. Now she's in an elevator with Carol and some other guys, and those guys are talking about the shootings. They basically think the shooter is an anti-hero. They call him a vigilante, and they're making jokes about him. Of course, him. Who would ever think the person going around shooting different people in the city is a woman? Back again with the inequality. Carol hears that and tells Erica she wants to open up her show to phone calls. She argues with it at first, but she eventually agrees to do it. Now she's in front of the mic, and she talks about someone who's out there playing God, killing people in the name of justice. Let's not forget she's talking about herself. Anyway, she opens the phone lines, and as expected, there are all sorts of opinions coming in. One lady even calls and asks if the vigilante has a girlfriend, and was about to offer up her number on live radio before Erica cut her off. And then a guy calls and claims he's the guy and tries to offer his number up to the lady who called. New Yorkers are a different breed, man. But all those calls trigger Erica and she is had it up to here. So later that day, she goes to report herself to the police. But the cops make it a little difficult for her to report herself. The irony, right? So she leaves. As she's walking home, sounds from the different shootings are playing in her head. A woman calls out her name repeatedly, but Erica does not answer. She gets to some place and calls Sean. Nothing happened. She just wanted to talk and she thought of him. Hmm, okay. She asks him what he does when he can't can't sleep and he says nothing. As she's on the phone, she sees a man walking to the building she's in, so she makes her way to the elevator. Sean offers to stay with her on the phone until she can get some sleep, but she tells him not to bother. Before he gets off the call, he hears the ding of the elevator. Keep that in mind. But wait a goddamn minute, that's Moreau. She follows him to his car and asks him, why do you think you can hurt people? Just do damage and walk away? But he's confused. He doesn't know what is going on. Erica reaches for her back. We all know what she was trying to take out, but Moreau thinks she's a paparazzi who was reaching for a camera. So he takes a crowbar and hits her hand with it. He doesn't want his picture taken. Sir, she's here to take your life, not your picture. Erica punches him in the nose, hits him with the crowbar, and pushes him down to his death. Next thing we see is Sean and his partner examining Moreau's body in the crime scene. Erica's back home now and she can't even walk. Her neighbor helps her up into her house and helps stitch the cut she got from the crowbar. While she's stitching her up, Erica confesses to her that she killed a man tonight. Meanwhile, Sean goes up the elevator at Moreau's building and he hears that ding. He immediately recognizes it. Back to Erica, Jose doesn't seem shocked by what Erica just told her. Apparently, she has seen worse. Back home, she saw young boys kill their own parents. She says anyone can be a clapper. Profound words from Jose yet again. Next day, Sean and his partner are discussing last night's case. 
Sean is connecting you with the clappings from the supermarket and the subway, but his partner thinks they aren't connected. The murder weapon is different after all, but Sean asks him to go get the guy from the subway, the one with the iPod. He goes out and does just that. Sean then calls Erica and asks her to meet with him somewhere. She shows up and he asks her what time she slept last night, and of course she lies, not knowing he's already onto her. Sean now says they're going to interview a witness to a shooting, and she can't reference it on her show. Can you guess who that witness is? Come on, you can do this. Yep, it's Chloe. Erica says hi to Chloe. Chloe says hi back. She says she likes Erica's necklace. Erica hands it to her and tells her to tell the police everything she saw that night. Somewhere in there, the two ladies seem to have communicated with each other, because Chloe then tells Sean that she saw nobody, and nobody saw her. Erica and Sean leave the room, and he asks her why she called him last night. She said it was because she couldn't sleep. So he asks, and you were in bed? And she just answered, no, I couldn't sleep. I guess the cat is out of the bag now, isn't it? Sean and his partner are now talking to the guy from the subway, and he says he didn't see any vigilante. He mentions all the people who were on the subway, and when he mentioned a woman, Sean's interest was piqued. He asks the boy to describe the woman for an artist to sketch, and while that is going on, his partner is asking him where he's going with this. He says women kill their kids, their husbands, boyfriends, shit they love. They don't do this. Oh brother, you will be shocked. Now, we see Erica arriving at her house with a box in her hand. She goes in and opens it, and it's full of her wedding invitations. She opens one, says to reflection, you left a hole in me, but I'm done now. By the way, the sketch the boy's recollection could produce was Jennifer Aniston. He's no help. His mind is elsewhere. <coughs> Erica is now lying on her couch, listening to her interview with Sean, when he knocks on her door. He has her ring, which was stolen by those guys who clapped her boyfriend. He asks her to come with him and help ID the criminal from a lineup, and she says no. He manages to convince her, though, and they go. She identifies number three, but she claims not to for some reason and leaves. Sean can tell something is wrong. He runs after her and follows her into the elevator. He says they should go get some food. She says she's not hungry, but he insists. At the restaurant, she's reminiscing about how times were when she was with David. Then he segues into talking about Moreau and about the new development on the subway case. Then he says that when he was a rookie, he used to give himself a test. He would ask himself, if there was someone that I knew that had committed a crime, would I have the fortitude to put them away? Big, big question, I can't lie. Erica asks, what kind of someone? And he says, someone close to me, like the best friend I could ever hope to have. She then asks him what his answer is, and he says, I always hoped that I would have the courage and the dedication to say yes. And do you? She asks. He says, I do. And it's important that you know that. She says she knows that, and it's what she admires about him. This is some next level mind games going on here, giving Death Note a run for its money. Sean then says, one more piece of evidence, and she goes down. And she replies, and you'll find it. You're a good detective. You miss nothing. Oh, give this woman an Oscar. She's really staying in character. But just before she leaves, Sean holds her hand and says, I wonder what David would think of this woman with a grudge. She says she doesn't know. She leaves and goes straight to different pawn shops trying to find out if anybody recognized the ring. One guy does and gives her a name and address. Erica goes after the lady whose name is Shauna. By the way, Sean is stuck in traffic talking to a cop back at the station. He asks him to trace a call for him. It's that call with Erica that night. He's trying to find out where that call was made. Erica finds Shauna who says her boyfriend cheated and gave her the ring as a makeup gift. Classy. Erica asks for the address of her boyfriend but she doesn't give it away. The result from the call trace comes in and the guy tells Sean that the call came from the vicinity of Roosevelt Island. The man thinks it's a case of cheating so he doesn't put too much thought into it. Little does he know. Anyway, Shauna has a change of heart and texts Erica the address she wanted and a video of what those criminals did to her and Erica breaks down right in the middle of the road watching it. She finally puts herself together and sends a text to Sean. The text says goodbye with an attachment of the video of those guys brutalizing her and her boyfriend. Now we see him running. Will he be able to stop her? Because Erica's already at the address. It's a big building. She's walking all around. You can just tell that a lot of sussy stuff goes on here. But she sees some guys and could instantly recognize Curtis. She goes down to meet the guy holding Curtis and says, I want my dog back, and shoots the man in the eye. She takes her dog and runs away. Some guys are chasing her. She claps one of them and this is just when Sean is getting the address. He's driving like Aaron Paul right now, and you can understand the need for speed. Get it? I'm sorry. Erica is still in the building trying to hunt down the last guy, the very one who clapped her boyfriend, but he attacks her from behind and has her in a chokehold, and not in the fun way. But Sean shows up and the assailant drops his weapon and goes flat on the ground. Erica wants to shoot the criminal, but Sean tells her she doesn't have the right to. But he, on the other hand, has the right to hunt him down and shoot him. He manages to de-escalate the whole situation and take the gun from her. But just when I thought he was going to cuff both of them and take them in, he hands Erica his gun and says, now if you're gonna use a gun, you make sure it's legal. What a climax, man. Erica shoots the criminal who clapped her boyfriend and then hands herself over to Sean. You can take me now, she says. But he says no. He's not taking her in. Sean has a perfect cover-up story. They'll pin all of the killings that have been happening on the three guys who killed David. So Sean tracked them down and a shootout happened. To make the story believable, he asked Erica to shoot him. Enough to wound him, but not kill him.
him. She does. Then he asks her to leave. He releases Curtis, calls for backup, and they come and wheel him away. Last thing we see is Curtis running to Erica. Then we hear Erica's voice say, there is no going back to that other person, that other place. This thing, this stranger, she is all you are now. Moral of the story, just be yourself.